good to have Brother Jeremy and his girls back visiting with us, and uh, just a pleasure to fellowship with him. And this morning, we're going to do a have a baptism at the end of the service. Uh, Al came to me. Can I tell him? You don't mind? He came to me and talked to me in my office last Sunday. And I, I, I like this, if, if, if ever God's dealing with you, like during the service, and maybe you just want to come visit with me for a while about something, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm available. But he, he said, Pastor, I want to talk to you in your office. So we went back into the office, and he told me that he felt like at one time in his life he had given his life to the Lord, and... As time went on in his life, he kind of got away from that. A lot of us experience that. A lot of us, a lot of people have been there. And I'm going to preach on that issue this morning about, I believe people can backslide. And I'm going to show you from the Bible what that means. Uh, some people, when they backslide, they get out of church. And they don't come for a while, and then God deals with them and brings them back. Some people stay in church and backslide. And they put on a sort of a cover, because they're still coming to church, and they make it look like everything's fine, but it's not, really. And they're just torn up inside because they feel like they're living two lives. And I may preach on that next Sunday. But anyway, he just, he just said, I just, he said, I want to know that if I died, I'm going to heaven. And I just showed him scriptures. And we prayed there in my office and he's glad to be here this morning. Amen. He said, I asked him, I said, Al, how you doing? He said, man, he said, just everything's like. Better and I said food tastes better doesn't it? he said yes <clears throat> I'm just telling you and Anybody listening to my voice in fact, let me do this if you've ever And it's okay because you're in a room full of people you you'd be surprised how many have done this if you've ever Known the Lord at one time and got away from that and come back to it raise your hand look at there Oh, listen it happens and it's what I was preaching last Sunday about sometimes we'll start out in faith and then things happen and that dies away from us but then God brings us back and once you're back you're back to stay you're not going anywhere nobody's going to talk you out of it amen that's what I like. That's, that's the kind of stories I like. There's no shame in coming back. Don't let anybody tell you that, well, you ought to be ashamed for what you did. You call yourself a Christian. You saw the hands this morning. It happens to practically all of us. And like I said, some people backslide out of church. Some people backslide while they're in church. But it happens. And I'm glad that God has called you back. Does anybody have a, just a word of testimony this morning? I just feel like opening it up this morning. Anybody just want to share? Go ahead, Jared. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Amen. 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 I remember me and Sterling coming to visit you that night. I'll never forget it. Somebody else just got a word of testimony. Gwenny? We're going to pray for mommy and pray that her belly doesn't hurt. Amen. <laughs> Who else? Word of testimony. Just got it. You got something. You got to say it. Go ahead, Lynn. I was waiting on you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I, I think God's leading me on Sunday nights. I uh, said this during Sunday school. I'm going to teach on the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Now, it may take me eight years to do that, but there's a lot of lessons. God uses Israel to teach us us. And God let Israel wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And that was, 40 is the number like of probation. And at the end of it, only two people that came out of Egypt entered into the promised land. But those two did so by faith. They trusted what God said. And I don't regret the wilderness that God let me be in because it's made me who I am today. Anybody else? One more. Go ahead, Sparky. Yep. Amen. Amen. Hard thing for mom and dad to take is to realize that our children have flaws. But it's good to remember that Lisa and I have our flaws. And so we praise the Lord for what God's given us. Take your Bible. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. My mind is running all over the place this morning, so you help me. You pray for me, you help me preach this morning, and be patient with me, bear with me. Some days when my mind does that, it's hard for me to focus, hard for me to concentrate. And I think the devil likes to play in that little playground, so you just pray for me this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to try to convey to you this morning... Uh, the dangerous ground that going backwards, going, we call it backsliding, that is a Bible word. Some say it's not possible. I think it is. And we saw the hands. Most, most people in this room have done it. If you are a, if you are a new Christian, um, and you have not experienced this, what I can tell you, some, some might say, like Peter did, that'll never happen to me. Jesus telling Peter, Peter, tonight, before the cock crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter just, he swore that he would never deny Jesus, and yet he did. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And what happens is that we can get too proud, and then God's not going to use us, and we end up falling flat on our face, thinking that we could never do that. I thought 
that I would never do that. And I did. And so I just want to preach to you this morning about the dangerous ground that backsliding is. And I want you to listen to the Word of God this morning, teach you and warn you about what's waiting for you when you fall back. And I want you to think about, we use this term backsliding, and it's a direction that you go in. And here's how I want you to see it. Heaven is before you. God's reward, God's kindness, God's blessing, and everything that we are now is ahead of us. That's the direction that we're supposed to be going in. The devil is back here. Think about what Jesus said. Get thee behind me, Satan. So the devil is back here. And that's the direction that he wants you to go, is back there. And again, you might be thinking, that'll never happen to me. I thought that. And those of us that have fallen back, we're telling you, you will. You will. I don't think anybody is exempted from this. Because, uh, it's like I say, I ask for hands, hands all over the building. This church is full of backsliders. That by the grace of God, He brought us back to where we need to be. By the grace of God. And so I want you to think about those two directions. You've got a choice this morning of which way you're going to go. In Hebrews 10, verse 35, the Bible says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. The word confidence has the word faith in it, in the form of, like, fidelity. Con means with. Fide means faith. You have faith, or you say you have faith right now in what God said. But, you can't, and I have, and you have, Cast away that confidence so that at one point in your life, you were no longer going forward to where Jesus is. You were going back to where your sin was. The life that you used to live was back here and hell is back here. And that's where you were headed. You cast therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. There's a reward for faith. It's called eternal life. It's called heaven. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Verse 37, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. God's going to do what he said he's going to do in your life. Do you believe that? But what happens is we serve God for a while. Things don't turn out well. And we think, well, I'm serving God and all this bad stuff is happening to me. I didn't have this much trouble when I was lost. So we start thinking about going back. Verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. Now let me tell you. Backsliding has little to do with your actual deeds. It has everything to do with your faith or your lack of faith. That's what it has. That's that's what it's all about. The just shall live by faith. Look at at that verse, verse 38. But if any man draw what direction? Back. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. Verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Perdition is destruction. Perdition is hell. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, Al came to me last Sunday, and he admitted, Mike, at one time, 
I, I, I believe I was saved. I, I asked God to come into my life. Asked God to forgive my sins. I thought that, that, I, that everything was well. But he said, then I went back. And I drew back. And I lost confidence. I lost faith. But God saw in him his will, his work. He allowed it to happen. And Al, God had every intention 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago of letting you go and then bringing you back at this time. God had every intention of that. God knew what he was doing. So for some of us, God allows us to go back to teach us the lesson and then bring us forward. But there's always some who walk back and stay there. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You pray for me this morning while I preach. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you to help me preach this message. Help me to preach it right. Help me to say what you want me to say. Help me to teach these ideas and these precepts, your statutes, your judgments. Help me to teach them. Help me, Lord, to warn people that backsliding happens. Help me, dear God, that if somebody listening to me right now is in a backslidden state, help me, God, to warn them and to encourage them God's not done with you you'll come back to him God will take you back like like the prodigal son his daddy took him back and his relationship then was better than it ever was with his daddy and that's how it is with us God help me to warn somebody that's backslidden today that you can bring them back and you will bring them back but Father, there may be somebody listening to me today who has drawn back and they have no intention of ever getting right with you. God, I'm going to warn them of what's coming. And you're going to have them hear it. And when they stand before you in judgment, they're not going to be able to say that they weren't warned. Lord, I'd rather it that they come back to you. But Father, I have a duty. You've, you've called me, Lord, to say things that sometimes I don't want to say. But I have to say to maybe somebody out there, you were warned. You were encouraged. You were preached to. You could have come back, but you chose not to. God, there's a very dangerous place that people abide in right now. Lord, help me to preach to them. Help me to do it in love. Help me to warn people and encourage people that they can come back to you. Bless this message. Help me to preach it, I pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Now turn to John. I'm just going to go through Scripture this morning. You know how I do. I'm just going to go Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. John chapter 6. It, was, it, it's, it always marvels me and amazes me at the the way the Bible's packaged together, there's a verse, it's John 6, verse 66, and it looks like 666. If you've ever read that verse, it looks like it belongs in John 666. Because it's about those that walk back from Jesus. They were, watch this now, listen to me, they were his disciples. Or they claimed to be. And they walked back away from Jesus. And they never followed him ever again. And that verse is in John 666. So let's back up. Let's go to verse 61 in John 6. And get the context so we understand what's going on. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. He said unto them, doth this offend you? Now I want to tell you something. 
You're, you're, if you're going to follow God, you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to follow the Word of God, there are things that God is going to say to you that's going to offend you and hurt your feelings. Because the truth hurts. Doesn't it? Especially when you get slapped upside the head with it. Especially when it's a reality that you don't want to face and you don't want to deal with. And you would just soon just, you know, just block it out. And not let it have any effect on you. But I'm telling you, God, if this Bible is going to be preached, God's going to offend you. And Jesus was telling it right to these people. And they were offended by it. And Jesus knew it. So this is what he said. In verse 62, he said, What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. And again, it's talking about the Bible, the Word. This Bible is right, this Bible is true, and this Bible will hurt your feelings. Verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. Now look at, look at your Bible. Again, Al, God had it all planned out. You're the, you're the focus of my sermon today because you, this is you. He's thumbs up. I got you. God had it all planned out. You were going to come to him. God's going to say, that's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then you're going to go do what you were going to do. And God had every intention at the right day, at the right time of pulling you back out and saying, now, now you're mine forever. Amen. But there are those that God already knows they're not coming back. And usually it's because they got offended in church or they got offended by the word or they got offended by something the preacher said and they didn't like it. And they said, well, that's not, that's not what I believe. That's not what I, what I think it is. And they fall out and they never come back ever again. I've told this story a hundred times. I'm going to tell it again. A man that I knew. I knew him all my life. We tried to witness to him. Tried to get him, lead him to the Lord. He would never come around. Finally, him and his wife, they moved off. They started going to another church. And that pastor was able to talk to him a little bit. And he came and he bowed at the altar. And it seemed like everything was great. I mean, this is an older man. But the deal was, he, he was in his, in his occupation. He was a high school science teacher. And he was one of these intellectuals that he felt like he knew more than the Bible. So he's floating alone in church and all of a sudden the preacher was led to preach a sermon about the creation. Genesis chapter 1. And he said, according to the time frames of the Bible, the earth was created in six days, six thousand years ago or thereabouts. Well that man got offended at that. That made him mad. That did not match his scientific mind. And he, told, he let that pastor have it after church. He said, how dare you? He said, you must be an idiot for believing that stuff in the Bible that it was 6,000 years ago God created it in six days. That didn't happen that way. And that man got out. And he died in that condition. He died not believing what God said. People get offended. People get up. They get mad. They walk out. They ain't coming back. And But look at verse... 64, but there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. He knew it from the beginning. You didn't fool God. So verse 65, and he said, Therefore said unto you that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. And look at John 666. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know what that means? They didn't come back, Jared. And God already knew who they were. That didn't surprise him. They weren't fooling God. Jesus picked Judas specifically because he knew what Judas was going to do. He knew that Judas' conversion, his conversion was fake. He knew he didn't believe. He knew he didn't trust in God, didn't believe in what Jesus was doing. And he knew that he would buzz out and he knew he would, he would uh, turn on him and turn him in to the authorities so that he'd be crucified. Jesus knew all that. It, Jesus wasn't fooled and you're not fooling God either. 
God's not the same kind of fool that we are. Amen? So turn back to Hebrews. Boy, I've got the same verses in here twice. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. We're talking about how God brings people back from being backslid. Let me read this. Hebrews 10 again, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of war, reward, for you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Again, I want you to think of, here's, here's, here's what's ahead of you. The apostle Paul said, Forgetting those things that are behind. And I, I, I agree to that. There's always some psychologist out there, some psychiatrist, that wants you to go dig up everything that happened in your past, thinking that, that that's, that's the source of your problem. Well, that may be the source of your problem, but digging it up is not going to help. The Bible says forget about it. Forget about what you used to be and what you used to do and how you used to disobey God and all the sin that you got into. That is not you anymore. That's not me and that's not you. You may be like me, sometimes I have a hard time forgetting. And I'm not talking about what everybody else did. I have a hard time forgetting what I did. And sometimes that junk follows you around. And that's the devil trying to get you to come back. He's trying to convince you that there's no use in living for God anymore. There's no use in it. There's no gain in it. Why don't you just come back where the parties are and everything will be okay? Forgetting those things that are behind, I press toward the mark. Toward. That is that direction. That is, that's where Jesus is. That's where heaven is. But I want you to think about what's back there. What's back there was all of that junk where you disobeyed God. What's back there is all the parties, all the alcohol, all the drugs, all the people you slept with, all the people you did dirty, all the things that you stole, all the things that you lied about, the jail time, all the things that you lost, that's what's back there. What, what made you an angry, bitter Hateful person is back here. Don't go back. Your life now does not, is not about what you used to be. It is about what you can be and what you will be and what God is going to do in your life. And how God is going to be nice to you and kind to you. And how God is going to love you. And how God's going to have mercy on you. And how God is not going to give you what you deserve. He's going to give you better than what you deserve. Heaven is this way. So in Hebrews chapter 8. He said in verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. So just think about this. I asked for testimony and I heard from people all in this room who now watch this now you have a better ministry now than you did 20 years ago you had better testimony you're a testimony of somebody that yeah you knew God at one time but you you forsook all that and went out and did things that you shouldn't have done live live like the world lives and done all the thing the world does and God brought you back and now you have a better ministry now than you ever had before. You had a better testimony. It's not the testimony of the, of the one who says, bless God, I don't do this anymore. Bless God, I don't do that anymore. And it's all about what they do and don't do. It's to you, it's all about what God did for you. And that His mercy really does endure forever. It's a better ministry. And he said it was established upon better promises. Verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now I want you to notice in your Bible, there is an order to your Bible. 
Here is the Old Covenant. It's first. If you're going to start reading the Bible, you're going to start reading in Genesis. You're going to read the Old Testament. And what you're going to read is about all the things that you shouldn't do. And those are the things that you did. But then God, after the Old Covenant, gave us the New Covenant. And which is better, Jeremy? The old one where it said, don't do this, but you did it. Or the new one that says, I know you did it, but I'm going to have mercy on you. The new one. You see, we're not, watch this now, we're not going back to Mount Sinai. We're not going back to try to live under a covenant that we couldn't live under to begin with. The old covenant said, you better not do this. And if you do that, I'm going to punish you with death. That's the old covenant. I tried that. I failed at it. I'm not going back to the old one. I'm going forward to the new one. That's better. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should, he, then should no place have been sought for the second. Verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Watch this. Look at what your Bible says. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. That's what I preached on last Sunday. That's why you started out and then failed and it died and God resurrected it. And now it's better than it ever was before. And now you know for a fact that you're never going back to that place again. Somebody say amen. Turn to Psalm chapter 53. I'm going to give you scripture and scripture and I'm going to give you some more scripture. God looked down, verse, uh, Psalm 53 verse 2. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. And look at verse 3. Every one of them has gone back. Don't tell me you're not going to backslide. Don't tell me you didn't. Because I don't believe it. If you're going to live this life and walk the way God wants you to walk, God is going to let you go back to teach you the lessons that you need. To, you learned lessons back there, did you not? The prodigal son learned that living the way he lived only got him feeding the swine. But he knew that if he went to his father again, his father would restore him. And that's exactly what his father did. So which is better? Living a lie, making everybody think that everything's right and perfect with you. Or letting God destroy you, even after you believe, letting God destroy you and bring you back from your backslidden condition. See, I'm telling you, it happens. It happens to preachers. It happens to preachers' kids. It happens to preachers' wives. It happens to deacons. It happens to Sunday school teachers. It happens to everybody. Because every one of them is gone back. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. That is the person in a backslid condition. They've gone back. They've gone back to their filthiness. They don't do any good. They are workers of iniquity. They have no knowledge. And they will not call God and ask God for help. Sound familiar? While you was out getting snot up drunk in the bars every night, was you, was you praying in those bars? Was you singing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. No, you were singing bar songs. That's the condition of someone that goes back. They don't call upon God. They're workers of iniquity. They're filthy. And they've gone backward. Proverbs 14, 14. The Bible says the backslider. See, it's right there in your Bible. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. What does that mean? That means you're not doing what God said. You don't care what God said. 
You're going to do what you want to do. The devil filled you with promises of how good it was going to be if you just came back to the old gang and the old ways. Who in here ever has a dream about going back being in high school? Isn't that weird, Cubby? Are we the only two in the whole church? Jennifer? You have a dream like you're 40, 50 years old and you're going back in high school and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to do this a lot better than I did the first time. I'm going to be much more popular because I'm an adult now. And then you wake up and you're going, that was the stupidest thing in the world. Because the devil will promise you that if you go back to the old ways, it'll be just as good as it was before. And he's lying through his teeth. The backslider and heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from within himself. Isaiah 1, 4. Ah, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. And they are gone away backward. Back, remember backward is where your sin was, where your disobedience was, where your tortured life was. Because nobody, nobody ever gets saved being happy in sin. Nobody does. When God's ready to save you, He makes you, like Jared said, He makes your life so disgusting and so distasteful and you are so angry and bitter at yourself that you can't stand yourself. Other people couldn't stand you for years. Amen? And you're just now waking up to the fact that how rotten you are and you want something better. No sinner ever says, well, I'm happy in sin, but I get to go to heaven if I get saved. So I'll just get saved. That's not how it works. So, you're backslid. Am I talking to somebody here? I don't know. Am I talking to somebody online? I don't know, but you're backslid. And you're thinking that, oh, finally, I get to get away with all the stuff that I used to do and, and I won't have to feel guilty about it anymore. Well, let me tell you something. If, if you are, in fact, backslid and you're happy with that, there may be no coming back for you. What it's going to take is for you to be so disgusted again with yourself for going back there to begin with. That's the manifest sign that the Holy Spirit is still with you even when you went backward. And that He's going to pull you back out. Young people, would you listen to your preacher for a minute? Your mom and dad will tell you what I'm going to tell you. You're in church. They're bringing you to church. They're making you come. They're making you listen to the sermon. There's going to, you're going to hit a time in your life when they can't tell you what to do anymore. And you're finally going to get the freedom to go and do all the things that mom and dad would not let you do. Am I right so far? I promise you, you're going to fall. My mom realized when she was raising her rebellious children that at some point the faith that she had was going to have to be our own faith. And the only way that it can be is for us as her children to go out 
and disobey practically everything that she told us not to do, find out why she got saved, and come back begging for God to not cast us into hell. And I'm telling you, young people, once you get there, hopefully God will be standing there waiting for you when you cry out to Him. Let's have some adults say amen to that. Listen, I'm looking at, listen, young people, I know these adults. Every one of them practically raised their hand and said that once they got out of the house, they blew it. They did everything that they knew they were not supposed to do while they were living at home. This Bible's right. Isaiah 28, 13, But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little and there little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Let me tell you, waiting for you outside of your mom and daddy's care over you and their custody over you, waiting for you is a trap. I fell in it. Jody fell in it. Jared fell in it. Courtney fell in it. Al fell in it. Megan fell in it. Megan, shh, mom and dad sit right there. Don't tell them what you did now. There's nothing but a big old trap waiting for you. And the lion is waiting to devour you the moment you step out of mom and daddy's house. It's coming, is it not? Jeremiah 2, 19, thine own wickedness shall correct. Listen, look at this, look at your Bible. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. Isn't that how it happened? Your own stupidity and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. All of a sudden now, everything that God said, you're finding it to be right. And that was his plan was to bring you back if that was God's plan. But let me tell you something. God already knows you and He knows your future. And God already knows who's going to make it back and who isn't. So don't think that I'm saying that when you grow up, well, Preacher Mike said, I just go out and find all that sin and jump in it, and God will bring me back. There are some that He doesn't bring back. Am I right? Because we all know somebody that was like us, that as soon as they got out of mom and daddy's house, they left church, they still ain't coming back. And some of them have already died in that condition. And God knew it. Thine own wickedness, thy, uh, thine own wickedness shall correct thee, thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. It's bitterness. You may, you may end up hating me, the preacher. You may end up hating your mom and dad for trying to raise you a certain way, keep you away from certain things. But you're going to find out that the life that they were trying to protect you from is nothing but bitterness. You see, Solomon, Solomon actually got to do what all of us lusted after to do. He got to do it. And he wrote at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, it's vanity, it's vexation. It brought me nothing, and I wish I'd never done it. Megan, before you leave, hold on. Raise your hand. Hang on, hey, I'll let you go in a minute. You stand up, stand up. Raise your hand. If, you're, if there are things that you are so sorry you did, it hurts you to this day. 
Okay, now you can go. Because <laughs> that boy's got to go to the bathroom, so I, I get it. A life full of regret. And in some cases, it follows you around the rest of your life. There are some things that you are never going to be able to walk away from in this life. And all that does is make us think, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Lot's wife. These are examples out of your Bible. Verse 26, his wife looked what direction? See, she was headed. God's salvation was over this way. And Lot and her two daughters and her were headed in that direction. But she stopped and looked back. And God killed her right then. So, if you think that I'm telling you that, well, once you grow up, you can go out and do whatever you want to and God will save you back, it doesn't always happen that way. In Numbers chapter 14, the whole children of Israel lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation has said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. You know what they're doing? They're looking back. Or would God we had died in this wilderness and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. And God made them walk 40 years in the wilderness until they dropped in the wilderness and died. They never got to the promised land. Because all they wanted to do was turn around and go back. They didn't make it. Whew. Boy, I got, I got a lot of examples here, but I'm going to wind this thing down. Take your Bible, turn to Jeremiah. Chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. Lot's wife did it. Israel did it. Lots of people walked back. Some of them made it back to God. Some of them didn't. Jeremiah chapter 3. I'm preaching to those who right now may be backslid. So, bear with me, I'm almost done, okay? And then we're going to baptize Al. I'm preaching to those that right now, you are in a backslid state. You know you are. There's no questioning it. You don't read your Bible, you don't pray. You may be coming to service, either here or online, but you may not be. Or, you just, you're just out there, you're living in sin, you're disobeying God, and you know it. So in Jeremiah chapter 3, this is, this is what God is asking you to do. Or what God is saying to you that He wants to do. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 6, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. You know what that means? You saw other people backslide, and you saw what God did to them, but that didn't stop you. Because I'm going to tell you something. When sin pulls on you, it usually doesn't let go easily. And God will show you, this is what I'm going to do to you now, for you, for if you disobey me, and we think, oh no, that's going to happen. But we do it anyway. 
backslide. So God said, I put her away and gave her a bill of divorce, and yet treacherous sister Judah feared not. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and stocks. That means she's worshiping idols. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintedly saith the Lord. And that's the people, that's the people who backslide sitting in church. They won't turn back to God, but they'll act like in church that they're right with God. That could be you. It could be any one of you. It could even be the preacher. Because I want to tell you something. I backslid and never missed a Sunday school. Never missed a service. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel had justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Now look at verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. And I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. God says, Return. I'll take you back. I'll do it because I love you. Because I want you to know that even though I know what you've done, I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you just like that. And I'll take everything that you've ever done and I will cast them into the sea and I'll remember them no more. <laughs> only acknowledge, verse 13, only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. See, when you're ready to come back, you must be ready to repent in order to come back. Don't you dare think that God is just going to get over what you did. Well, I'm back, God. That must be a blessing to God. You come back on your knees. Turn, verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I'm married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. God will take good care of you. God will be a shepherd to you and lead you into everlasting life. If you'll come back. So to you who's backslidden today, I don't know who you are. It's not my business to know who you are. You may be online watching and you're backslid right now and you haven't missed a, a sermon that I put on the internet. But God is dealing with you right now and telling you, you're not right with God. There are even degrees. Sometimes we get a little bit away from God and God will ease us back in or God will chasten us back in or whatever. But sometimes we get far away from God. And that's where we think that we're not going to be able to come back. And yet God is asking you, he's begging you, he's pleading you. Will you return unto me? Will you come and confess your sins? Because I already know what you did. Will you come back? Please, will you come back? God said, I'm married to you. Something that scares me more than anything is losing my wife. I don't want to lose my wife. I'm married to her. And God's saying the same thing to you. I'm married to you. I don't want to lose you. I love you. Will you come back? 